So my name is Maria Robaszkiewicz and uh, I will well, I would uh, chair the uh, morning or uh, afternoon uh, session today. Uh, and I'm very sorry for the quality of light uh, here. I'm not in my place and um, it's, it's a little bit awkward, but I think you can uh, possibly live with it. Um, I uh, would suggest that we, without further ado, uh, start with the session, and it is my pleasure to introduce. Uh, and uh, um, I very much hope that uh, I can cope with the names uh, as as well uh, that you can accept it. Uh, as you can see, my surname is also quite compli complicated, so I have it every day. <laughs> So hello again after the break. Hi. And uh, welcome Sharini Atri uh, from BPS Women's University and Priyanka Singh uh, from Arya Kanya Mahavirilaya in India with the talk on Earth and Feminist Space, Reading Sultana's Dream as Ecotopia. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Uh, I hope it's visible. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the chair and thanks to IAPH for giving us the opportunity to share our thoughts on this topic, Earth and Feminist Space, Reading Sultana Stream as Ecotopia. This paper is a joint one uh, written by uh, me and my co-author, Dr. Priyanka Singh. I'm Dr. Shalini Atri. So uh, the paper will discuss the connection of Earth and women in context of Sultana Stream. Earth's, as we all know, Earth's geology, climate change, notion of capitalism, and destruction of ecological resources are all subjects of debates among scholars, environmentalists, and eco-feminists, e economists, sorry. These issues compels, uh, compel these scholars to anticipate on the question of sustainability in the 21st century. The first part of the paper theorizes on the eco-feminist philosophy of Vanna Shiva as she looks into the deeper meanings of ecology, femininity and prakriti, that is nature, with an emphasis on the more humane aspect shifting from the dominant scientific paradigm, uh, which I'll be taking up. While the second part of the paper analyzes Begum Rukaya Shekhawat Hussain's Sultana Dream, uh, a narrative of ecotopia uh, that, uh, offering a revolutionary combination to handle the ecological crisis successfully, this will be dealt by uh, Dr. Priyanka Singh. So uh, to begin with, the rise of science, development, and industrial uh, revolution that laid the foundation of patriarchal mode of uh, economic development and industrial capitalism are viewed as main cause of nature and women destruction. The scientific revolution uh, in modern times is seen to transform nature from terra matter into machine and a source of raw material, consequently removing all ethical and cognitive constraints against its violation and exploitation. The Industrial Revolution converted economics from the prudent management of resources for sustenance and basic need satisfaction into process of commodity uh, production for profit maximization. Industrialism created a limitless appetite for resource exploitation and modern science provided the ethical and cognitive license uh, to make such exploitation possible, acceptable and desirable. The new relationship of man's domination and mastery over women, their exclusion from participation as partners in science and development, and need uh, and uh, yes, uh, in science and development with more nature pros, uh, uh, prone solutions is to be looked upon. Modern science is projected as universal, value-free system of knowledge which has displaced all other belief and knowledge systems by its universality and value neutrality by the logic of its method to arrive at objective claims about nature. Last few years have seen 
a feminist scholarship recognizing the dominant science uh, system emerging as a as a liberating force not for humanity as a whole but for masculine and patriarchal project with, uh, which necessarily entails the subjugation of both nature and women published in latin in 1516 thomas uh, more's utopia basically talks about uh, the uh, idea of uh, it talks about ideal society with perfect citizens and this idea was extended by hanna faragala in their article ecotopia between traditions and technology which characterized utopia as an ideal imaginary state at uh, of social and political perfection so ecological utopia thus provides a dialogue for a more sustainable society which can be achieved by the preservation of wealthness uh, we have uh, used the term ecotopia referring to ecologically utopian state which is an idea based on calebas uh, calebacks uh, novel ecotopia that describes a society in which recycling is a way of life gas powered cars are replaced by electric cars and bicycles are placed in public spaces in the novel the leading edges are patterns of actual social experimentation taking place in the american west the concept of stable state is built upon the idea that nothing produced in ecotopia should have an impact on the well-being of nature everything should be recycled and reused uh, this uh, uh, the stable state is what what uh, what is called as a utopian kind of utopian state so uh, eco ecotopia means ecology plus utopia uh, so uh, the emergence of contemporary sustainable conscience is associated with rachel carson seminal book silence uh, silent spring which was published in 1962 and carson's articulation and critique of scientific approaches in her work dominate the eco feminist thought which raised debates and even the work of howard odom particularly environment power and society pioneered notions of ecological engineering economics and environmental accounting so women's aspiration to live in balance with nature thereby waging a movement against maldevelopment and environmental degradation global capitalization and the need for indigenous cultures and economic values and programs based on sustainability has found uh, its expression in eco feminism and uh, it basically uh, the earth or nature becomes the central category of analysis in this context it challenges the nature culture dualism uh, the ravaging of earth has made the eco feminist free think on life negating philosophy of capitalism and science that is causing harm to both nature and women the green politics uh, calls for structural changes in uh, society where feminist ethics binds together to create an ecotopia that is green is ecotopia uh, sorry green is utopia if if nature is with us then it is a utopian state so the questions uh, uh, consequently raised nature women development and science maintain a harmonious relation if uh, science technology and capitalism a developmental necessity it is are the major causes uh, of uh, destruction of nature and women and how can an uh, ecotopian world be created so uh, in an attempt to address these questions uh, we have focused on manna shiva's ideas on women and nature she is an indian physicist eco feminist and she founded research foundation for science technology and natural resource policy that focuses on sustainable sustainable methods of agriculture she articulates the corporate domination that has been causing problems and provides for adaptive measure for realistic so solutions and these are her works globalizations new wars seed water and life forms earth democracy etc and uh, in her article empowering women she remarks that more uh, more sustainable and productive approach to agriculture can be achieved by reinstating the system of farming in india that is more centered on engaging women so um, shiva uh, vanna shiva co-authored a book eco feminism with german uh, feminist sociologist maria mais that combines uh, western and southern feminism with environmental technological and feminist issue and both the thinkers thinkers have condemned science and technology and opine that capitalism requires science to obtain maximum efficiency and uh, capital from nature this compels them to treat nature as a resource uh, calling it as reductionist mais maria mais particularly portrays indigenous women and nature as targets of scientific uh, domination and vanna shiva opines that development is causing uprootedness uh, and is responsible for violently serving Uh, severing the sacred bonds between people and soil 
She invocates pre-enlightened, pre-colonial, and pre-modern cultures based on feminist principles. Such knowledge systems expressive of respect for nature were often women-centered and women-friendly as she critiques the capitalism and overproduction, further emphasizing on assumption that tribal women or peasant societies are unproductive is not correct. And uh, in fact, they are the alternative model, model of uh, self-sustainability. They provide an excellent example when they uncover the link between ideologies of development, new technologies of reproduction and approaches to nature. So uh, taken this way, it is evident that scientific approach is adopted to com uh, com scientific approach is adopted to combat destructive science. So uh, how it uh, work, Shiva's work staying alive exports dominant culturalist tendency in eco-feminist literature, she remarks, it is managing the integrity of ecological cycles in forestry and agriculture that women's productivity has been most developed and evolved. Women transfer fertility, they transfer animal waste as fertilizer for crops and crops by products to animals as fodder. They work with forest. This partnership between women and nature work ensures the sustainability of sustenance. And the reason for ecological destruction is the forest is separated from river, the field is separated from forest, the animals are separated from crops. Each is then separately developed and delicate balance which ensures sustainability and equity is destroyed. She argues, uh, uh, she draws on the Indian mythology. Uh, Shiva, she introduces the notion of Prakriti. Prakriti means nature as feminine principle or life force an alternative universal basis for gender liberation. It will serve as a corrective to the uh, to the social uh, socially fragmented. The point of view in Indian cosmology, uh, Indian cosmology uh, is that the world is produced and renewed by the dialectical play of creation and destructive cohesion and disintegration. And she says that the manifestation of uh, this uh, primordial energy, which is the substance of everything, it its manifestation of this power, this energy is called as nature. It's Prakriti. Nature, both animate and inanimate, is an expression of Shakti. Shakti is uh, dynamic energy, uh, the feminine and creative principle of cosmos in conjunction with Purusha, that is the masculine principle. And it is Prakriti that creates the world. Nature is inherently active, a powerful productive force in the dialect of uh, creation, renewal and sustenance of all life. Prakriti is a popular category, one through which ordinary women in rural India relate to nature. Nature, a manifestation of feminist principle, thus is characterized by creativity, activity, productivity, diversity, connectedness, and interrelationship of all beings, including man, um, continuity between human and natural, and sanctity of life in nature. For women whose productivity in sustaining of life is based on nature's productivity, the death of, pra death of Prakriti, that is death of nature, is simultaneously a beginning of their marginalization, devaluation, displacement, and ultimate dispensability. The ecological crisis is death of feminine principle in everyday process of survival and sustenance. So the part one ends over here. The second part, which is based on Sultana's dream in light of Shiva's philosophy, will be taken up by Dr. Priyanka Singh. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank the chair also. Uh, I'll uh, continue the discussion from this point uh, and present an Ecotopian reading of uh, Sultana's dream. Uh, before I uh, you know, actually start, I just need uh, a confirmation whether I'm audible or not. Am I clear? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Sultana's Dream by uh, Begum Rukhaya Shekhawat Hussain foregrounds the eco-feminist perspective and has been phenomenal as far as feminist movement in the Indian subcontinent is concerned. Uh, it embodies uh, the Ecotopian perspective, adopting a positive solution-based approach and provides a holistic environmental philosophy that advocates nature-centered values, circularity, and natural regeneration of ecosystems. Rukhaya's aim has been to inspire women from all walks of life to act since action is uh, the quality of prakriti, that is nature. Her feminist dialogue is drawn on the need of women bound by different cultures, values, geography, and it is interesting to observe these tendencies in her work written 
as early as 20th century, that is in 1905. Uh, Sultana's dream is unique in the manner that Rukhaya proposes a feminist utopia where one witnesses a reversal of secluded enclosures in the form of Mardana. Mardana is a secluded enclosure where all men are you know, kept, kept there. A uh, scientific and environmental friendly approach is adopted to tackle the mess and problems created by men, whom she describes as complex creatures with predatory features, um, uh, in her short story, uh, Shristi Tatvo, uh, that is the theory of creation. Uh, thus, science is not necessarily repressive to nature and women. Uh, to analyze the story, uh, Sultana's Dream. The narrator, Sultana's Dream, it opens right away with the concern of the writer on the condition of Indian womanhood. The restriction of their uh, movement, even within the boundary of the home, is apparent. Uh, when Sultana... Uh, when she is invited by Sister Sara to have a look at the garden outside. And then Sultana thinks that it is uh, okay to go at this hour outside since the men's servant outside were fast asleep. The presence of Sister Sara and her insistence uh, to come out is a guidance that she offers Sultana from the uh, darkness and restriction of the Jananas. Uh, Jananas is uh, the secluded place for women, right? Uh, to the morning of hope and freedom and new thought. Sultana is soon taken to this imagined uh, lady land that is free from sin and harm and where virtue reigns. The capacity and likeness of women's temperament to live in closeness with nature is apparent when Sultana informs the reader how she loved taking long walks with Sister Sara in the botanical garden. In the lady land, the green grass carpets the metal streets. Sultana informs us, it was grand. I mistook a patch of green grass for a velvet cushion, feeling as if I was walking on a soft car carpet. I looked down and found the path covered with moss and flowers. One can hope of converting the city into a similar beautiful garden when Sister Sara tells that your Calcutta could become a nicer garden uh, than this only if your countrymen wanted to make it so. Uh, but uh, Sultana uh, does inform Sister Sara and tells that they, that is men, would think it useless to give so much attention to horticulture while they have so many other things to do, rather important things to do. Uh, one comes to understand that both nature and women have been entrapped in the very artificial world created and dominated by men. The possibilities and capacities of nature and women have been veiled, ignored and closed, while other things have been termed as important more so because of the unwillingness of man. The concept of Mardana for men, similar to Janana for women, is surprising as well as amusing for Sultana. Sister Sara elucidates the logic behind keeping men in their proper places where they ought to be, that is, shut indoors. She explains, Sister Sara, she explains that just as lunatics that cause mischief to men and creatures are under all circumstances captivated and sent to an asylum, Untrained men are capable of doing no end of mischief and cannot be trusted out of doors. Sister Sara asks the question that she raises uh, in the uh, uh, narrative. How can you trust those untrained, untrained men out of doors? One can clearly see her linking man's mischief to abuse of both nature and women, thereby restricting their nurturing and creative faculties and rendering them as mere objects concretized. Sultana also discovers that in the Lady Land, no one suffered, even mosquito bites leave aside epidemics as is being suffered in the man's world. The kitchen is an eco-friendly uh, setup. There is no sign of smoke, no chimney, no coal, no fire. Solar energy is most efficiently used for all the tasks. Sister Sara owes all these innovative scientific enterprises to, the, to their queen, whose inclination towards science is phenomenal. She has ordered all women in her kingdom to be educated and not to be married under, until the age of 21. In the university, action of water from the atmosphere, thereby stopping untamed rain, storms, and destruction. An instrument is invented to collect sun heat and use it for cooking, for locomotion, for providing warmth on cold days. On the contrary, the these women are laughed at for their scientific research and pursuits by men who term their uh, um, uh, endeavor, their scientific endeavors as a sentimental nightmare, 
Uh, this is what men call them. Uh, so uh, men of uh, these, this lady land, they engage themselves in their primary interest of attaining power and desire of ruling the other. So the prime minister, uh, he dedicate, we see him dedicating himself to increasing the military power and investing in warfare. Uh, but when the actual time comes, when that uh, you know uh, collection of warfare is to be tested, uh, um, uh, their entire uh, you know expertise fail. So the military expertise of men folk fail to defend the kingdom from the attack of the neighboring country, and uh, the impending doom is evident. So addressing the women folk, the queen asserts that women may not have sufficient training to use the armaments, uh, but they can at least try to counter the enemy using their brain power. Consequently, a plan is proposed. All men are sent to the Jananas. Later on, it was termed as Mardana. Uh, being wounded and tired, so all men willingly, you know, uh, they agree to go into the Jananas. The women uh, with, you know, uh, 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 the university chancellor, the professor, and 2,000, you know, students, they all come together and uh, they go on the borders and they use concentrated sunlight and heat on the enemy. Sister Sarah tells, uh, I'm quoting from uh, the narrator, uh, the heat and light were too much for them, the enemy to bear. They all ran panic stricken, not knowing how to con counteract the scorching heat. This was a weapon they did not know how to tackle and ran away. Big guns and armaments left behind by the enemy were burnt using the same sun and heat. They did not collect those armaments, but they destroyed it. Since then, tells Sister Sara, no one has dared to invade the Lady Land. It is important and noteworthy that what Sister Sara says, I'm quoting once again, we do not covet other people's land. We do not fight for a piece of diamond, though it may be a thousandfold brighter than the Kohinoor, nor do we grudge a ruler his peacock throne. We dive deep into the ocean of knowledge and try to find out the precious gems which nature has kept in store for us. We enjoy nature's gift as much as we can. So like... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to could... interrupt you, but are you approaching to your conclusions because your time uh, is nearly up? Uh, I, yeah, I'm moving towards uh, the conclusion now. Thank um, you so much. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, following the theoretical discussion on Ecotopia and the an analysis of uh, Rukhaya's, Sultana's, Begum stream, uh, it can be concluded, you know, there are uh, uh, nine points of conclusion. I'll just uh, go through them quickly. Uh, Sultana's stream is ahead of its time. It was written in 1905 when ecofeminism was not a burning issue as it was today. Though a fantasy record, it leaves behind a thought that somehow women have the capacity to be content to conserve and best utilize what is given to them. They have the capacity to live in coordination with nature rather than having a desire to rule and command and abuse it. Rukhaya empowers women with education, scientific temperament, authority, and power on in line with nature. Uh, locking men in the enclosures uh, should not be taken as a revengeful part on part of Rukhaya, but it should be seen as a logical action taken to keep the world safe. From, from the concretizing temperament and warlike insanity that man possesses. Pre-modern cultures have treated nature with respect and have legitimized female power. Women power women's knowledge has been uh, the work of the mainstay of dairy industry, experts in breeding and feeding farm animals in forestry too. Women's knowledge is valuable. So women have been custodians of biodiversity, thus women produce through biodiversity as stated by Vandana Shiva. Sultana's dream too moves around earth and sustainability and biodiversity where nature is treated with respect. Uh, next, uh, utopia of ecological plant-centric uh, science in Sultana's dream delves into ecological feminisms in South Asia, giving an alternative form of skillful rule as well as preservation of nature. Uh, it uh, delves into Shiva's eco-feminist philosophy, offering a view where science becomes non-violent, sustains life, and is endemic to women in South Asian culture, providing a firm ground on sustainability. Uh, the work demonstrates indigenous scientific methods developed by women, thus showing the harmonious relation between women and nature. Science is necessarily not a destructive enterprise. It is the human mischief that makes it disparaging. Therefore, nature, development, women, and science 
they can collaborate to create a self-sufficient bioregion. Second last uh, point on, of my conclusion is science and technology have to be engaged together to preserve nature under the right leadership. And to conclude with the last point, Ecotopia is a process and it needs the right vision, policy, temperament and commitment all together uh, to attain the, the goals. Uh, thank you for the patient listening and uh, we are open to suggestions uh, that would en enrich and improve our work. Thank you so much. Thank you for this wonderfully engaging talk. Uh, so now we are moving to the last uh, talk in our session before uh, the keynote uh, lecture and uh, the lunch break, uh, which is Corin Nakasi um, uh, from Helsinki University in Finland. And she will be uh, speaking about some indigenous women and unequal opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Anna. Can I ask you to tell me when is uh, after 19 minutes that I speak? So you, you can tell me that is one minute to 20. Thank you. Well, thank you. I will share my screen. OK, can you see my um, my screen? Yeah, great. Yes, we can. Uh, all right. Okay, so um, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Corinna, Corinna Casi. I'm a um, doctoral candidate in environmental ethics at Helsinki University in Finland. Um, the main topic of my thesis uh, is uh, um, non-economic value of nature. And lately I get closer to some indigenous uh, culture. Some indigenous people are the people living in the north of Europe. And that I decided to include also um, indigenous value in my, um, in my dissertation. But today, uh, this, I present a work in progress. I slightly changed the title, which now is Women, Nature and Colonial Struggle, the case of indigenous Sami women. Um, so uh, some um, outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, some background, some, some starting point, and then I will start from ecofeminism as my uh, starting framework. Um, I will give you some criticism of the traditional relationship between women and nature, and that will allow me to introduce uh, another framework that I will use, which is indigenous feminism. Then I will, I will present three case studies from three different indigenous community. The first one is from uh, Ingu, uh, Ingbu people uh, from Nigeria. The second one is from uh, Kanawaki people in Canada. And the third one is from um, some indigenous people in Sapmi, which is their region in the north of Europe. And I will uh, give some uh, concluding reflection. So oh, um, in the fall last year, when I was uh, um, working on this uh, uh, on this paper, I saw a tweet uh, in Twitter um, by the United Nations um, section on, on women uh, that talk about uh, uh, that today no country in the world has achieved gender equality. So the inequality between men and women are still unfortunately in place in many parts of the world. Also, Marcia Sen, uh, in one of his uh, um, in, in, in his book of 1984, uh, he mentioned that uh, unequal treatment between boys and girls are often accepted as natural or even appropriated. So, among all these inequalities, uh, I start uh, talking about the the separation between public and domestic sphere. Um, and I start with uh, some thought by uh, Susan Moller Hawking that we see in the picture on the uh, top right. Um, and she talked about that the separation of domestic and public sphere uh, brings significant consequences. For example, it obscures the intra-household women work. For example, children care, cleaning, caring for uh, elderly people or a sick member of the family, and also contributing in various ways to uh, men's work. Um, this lies in the assumption that only paid work 
uh, is uh, the, the, the work is in the public domain, only that count. Um, what does that, um, what are the consequences of this? That the domestic household is somehow invisible and it's considered non-productive, it's unpaid very often, and it's considered of less worth. Um, I start with this uh, topic among the many topics of the inequality between men and women, uh, because then I connect this in the last part of my talk uh, when I talk about uh, Sami women. Um, and uh, of course, in an environment where success is defined in economic terms, many women who have had to subordinate to their male partner uh, uh, do not realize that this is itself a form of oppression. So not everybody is aware of this as a form of oppression. Um, starting from 1990s, there, were, there has been a, a growing attention to the link between uh, women and nature. And especially ecofeminism uh, underline these links and also uh, seek for uh, alternative views that look more uh, harmonious and egalitarian. Um, in the same, at the same time, in, in the 70s, um, emerged the uh, Chipko movement in India. And on the bottom right, we see a picture of uh, that movement. This movement gave a lot of attention and was a movement where mainly women, not only, but mainly women, started to embrace tree in order to stop deforestation. Um, Continue talking about ecofeminism uh, and also in line with the, a bit of the previous uh, presentation. According to Maria Mies, which um, was a German um, feminist uh, um, and an activist, women are nature. What does Maria Mies mean with this? She means that uh, because they give birth, because they educate the children, uh, that is why they are nature and they have uh, a better understanding of nature. But uh, so considering this, it is, a paradox, it, it is a paradox that both women and nature are called unproductive. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they give birth and they are called unproductive, uh, connected with what uh, Susan muller was mentioning, you know, about the, uh, all the invisible work of women in the um, private sphere. Vandana Shiva, um, in, uh, in her work of 1989, um, mentioned this feminist principle. And uh, she claimed that this feminine, feminine principle embodied by uh, the practical relationship that women have with nature. Of course, Shiva uh, in that work referred mainly to um, Indian rural areas and especially in pre-colonial times. Um, but um, still, according to, to Shiva, this, the feminine principle supports them, which uh, traditionally lives in harmony uh, with natural cycle. And she emphasized this in opposition to the dominant Western uh, development, as we probably know, um, Shiva really um, is a support of um, a critical view on Western development, which is seen as patriarchal um, and serve as well as sustainable, unsustainable global market. Um, in both uh, view of uh, um, Mies and Shiva, the interest of environment becomes the interest of women due to their connection. And women are seen as the answer as well as the solutions for the environmental crisis. But this view has been a bit criticized because it, it puts also a lot of responsibility in women. For example, uh, Rosie Braidotti question uh, and criticize the rhetoric of uh, instrumentalizing women for environmental recovery. Not that they are not important, of course, but uh, she just emphasized this uh, critical view. Uh, Bina uh, Agarwal that we see on the uh, bottom right, um, instead of ecofeminism, she uses the term feminist environmentalism. And she suggests a slightly different understanding of the relationship between men and uh, women and nature, which is based on their experience. So uh, she gave example that, uh, for example, in pro peasants and in tribal and indigenous uh, community, indigenous women 
uh, the knowledge that they have um, of nature uh, come from their experience. So she, she talked about exper experiential uh, knowledge of nature, which, are, which is acquired uh, by um, personal uh, and individual uh, commitment in getting to know the natural cycle. Uh, and, it is, and this is based on everyday uh, practice uh, in the case of uh, poor peasant and uh, indigenous women. Uh, and this allowed me to go to my second framework, which is uh, the indigenous feminism. Um, within uh, the indigenous feminists, there is a, a disagreement on the role of women in indigenous community. Why? Well, uh, because uh, different community, uh, uh, different indigenous community, uh, community are structured differently, and uh, um, it's not good to generalize. Uh, but uh, uh, I would say that almost all indigenous feminists that I've read, at least, they agree on the negative consequences that European settlers' uh, action um, had and uh, is still having on the role of indigenous women. Uh, you might have a question, you know, why maybe we haven't heard about uh, um, the, the, the oppression of indigenous women. Well, we have to remember that many indigenous communities are, are still under many forms of oppression by the dominant societies. So they are not only indigenous women that they have, uh, they are under a form of oppression, but the whole community, the whole indigenous community are under a different form of oppression. And it has been one of the reasons why um, indigenous um, women have uh, started a bit later in comparison to other community to uh, claim their rights. Uh, when we talk about indigenous feminism, also called Aboriginal feminism, um, it's, a, um, it's a field of research that, that deals with issue of colonialism, sexism and racism intersectionally. Um, and the focus uh, of uh, this movement, the, sorry, this field, is the attention on uh, decolonization and issue of gender power in settler community as well as within indigenous community. Um, and this is uh, a claim by uh, Joyce Green that we see with the red and white um, uh, shirt on the right. Uh, I will now uh, start to present three different cases. And this is the first case, uh, the example of Nigeria and people. So we see in the map on the right, Nigeria and the, the dark green is the, the land of uh, Ingu people. Um, so basically Ingu people uh, live pretty um, in an harmonious way before uh, the, the British colonization. And the, uh, when the British came, the British policy of uh, in the indirect rule was sexist as and asymmetric. And women that were uh, before were living uh, rather uh, in equal terms with men were marginalized and robbed of their historical power. Um, this is a, a quote uh, concerning colonialism. Um, colonialism was an alienating historical condition that erased and silenced the, wo the voice of women. Uh, and this is a claim from the um, African um, feminists that we see on the right uh, in Zengu. Uh, they were uh, forced to, to become invisible. Uh, because they were denied education, employment, and decisional power, all, um, all uh, things that they used to have uh, before colonial time. And I also want to make a connection between the uh, in, invisible domestic work of women that I presented earlier of, uh, by Susan Moller, Moller Hawking. Um, at the same time, non-Western tradition were uh, exoticized as ethnographic, while on the other hand, the material, the literature material of uh, white Western culture was considered as, as natural, so naturalized and proposed as unproblematic. Um, in the, the last picture on the bottom, you see a poster by a Sami community, is a, is a Sami uh, artistic um, community that is called Suopan Terror. And you know, uh, when the, um, uh, the non-Sami and the Sami got together, you know, 
how the way how to solve problem is to get rid of of the Sami or of the indigenous uh, culture. The second example is an example from Canada, from the um, Kinawaki indigenous community. Also, we see a, a, a map on the bottom um, that uh, it's very close to Montreal uh, in Quebec, in Canada, uh, the land of uh, Kawaki people. And uh, actually, they have it. They, they used to have before a colonization a traditional gender role that fostered harmony, uh, and uh, the community was uh, based on uh, gender division labor. That it was based mainly um, and connected to the food to the food system. Um, from this division, uh, re re gender responsibility followed, but not in a negative term. Uh, this is uh, how uh, Delomier that we see on the right uh, presented. And uh, uh, this gender division uh, kept the role complementary between men and women. And uh, a, a way that this community had tried to resist colonialism and, and also resist the concept, of, the concept of gender that they did not have uh, before colonial time. Uh, so, for example, traditionally, women's responsibility um, included food preparation, childcare, and education. Uh, teaching traditional indigenous values such as love, compassion, caring for the community. And the connection between um, women and nature came from the spiritual connection that women uh, um, has naturally with the earth, with the moon and um, with the garden, which according to the um, Kainawaki, uh, all feminine entities. The last example is from uh, the Sami community. So uh, you can see in the maps, uh, the red um, region and also the blue region, that is Satmi, which is uh, normally uh, known as the name of Lapland, uh, which is the name that the colonizer gives to this region. So I would invite you to call it Satmi, which is the, 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 the land of the Sami people. This is how they call it. And the Sami, uh, commonly known as Lapish or Laplander, um, again, this is the name that the colonizer give, gave to them, whether the name that they choose for themselves is Sami, and this is the, the name that I'm going to use. So um, they live across the north of Norway, north of Sweden, north of Finland, and northwest of Russia. And they are divided in community. Here you have two pictures uh, with different uh, colors in the dresses and the different color in the dresses and the different decoration identify different communities. Um, I could speak widely about them, but unfortunately uh, I have to uh, move on. Um, so, um, uh, Raina Kwokkanen, which you see on the um, bottom, on the picture on the bottom, is a Sami um, indigenous scholar. She is associate professor of political um, sciences at the University of Rovaniemi in the north of uh, Finland. Um, as she mentioned that um, Sami, so all the community, is still struggling with um, a, a lot of um, different struggles, for example, identity crisis, like psychological stress, violence, mental disorder, increased alcoholism, and so forth. And uh, um, like other uh, Aboriginal or Indigenous population, um, women, uh, Sami women um, enjoyed in the past an historical form of equality with men. So uh, again, we see always a form of equality in pre-colonial time. Um, that of course was also characterized by uh, you know, sheer responsibility in different domains. You have two minutes left. Oh, okay, I try to run out, uh, I mean, go quicker. Uh, they rather were uh, independent and only with the um, advent of Christianity and Lestadianism, which was a um, movement within Lutheran church, influenced a lot their image. What happened to them? They started to uh, have the image uh, and the myth of these strong Sami women. And this uh, was created in order to distinguish Sami women as a strong Sami women, and also the image of Sami culture with the, uh, with the, um, as a matriarchal society, which was not, in order to really distinguish uh, Sami women by um, non-Sami women, for example, Finnish women, uh, 
Swedish women and so on. Um, and but this was uh, an artificial an artificial construction and put stress uh, and and um, and put a lot of stress and it revolted against uh, some women themselves. So, um, as you might know, one of the main activity of Sami people uh, livelihood activity is the reindeer herding, and nowadays is commonly associated to male practices. But it wasn't like this in the past. Uh, according to uh, the Sami feminist uh, Jorun um, Eikyok, that we, we see on the bottom on, in the picture, um, Sami, um, Sami women continue to help in most of the production. Um, but then the, the, their work was um, invisible. And this is how I connect at the beginning. The result was that um, Sami women abandoned slowly, slowly the, herd and re um, the reindeer herding, and they were um, occupied themselves with other livelihood practices, for example, salmon fishing, uh, collecting uh, berries, mushroom, herbs, and so forth. Um, Concluding, so um, my presentation, I want to show that the Ingo and the Sami indigenous women, for example, um, uh, are, um, are not in position to argue in their own term, um, and they need empowerment and autonomy within, within their community. Why I claim that they are not. In the case of Sami people, which is closer to my research, um, there is so many uh, type of oppression uh, against the, the, the Sami community, uh, you know, as a whole, that they feel that if they would struggle within the community uh, for, for Sami women's rights, they would uh, weaken the community, which is already under a lot of uh, oppression. There were a lot of development program that supposed to be gender neutral, but instead reproduced the binary uh, structure, um, the binary Western structure, so they didn't help. Uh, and very often women um, within indigenous community are aware of their subordinate position, but they are unable to challenge their exclusion. And here I um, I come um, I call into the the four um, a concept uh, that was made by Martha Nussbaum and James Bowman when they talk about uh, political poverty as a lack of re relevant political capacity. So finally, I want to to mention that agency is not only. Uh, you know, a moral agent, but is rather a feeling capable of political agency. And that is what, um, uh, in my view, Sami women uh, need to empower about. Um, and I also, and this is, you know, my concluding words, is that um, it, 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 because before colonial time, they were not a gender issue. What I, um, what I claim is that now they have uh, to in, indigenize this gender inequality uh, within the Sami indigenous culture. Um, and only perhaps in this way, they can rebalance and uh, go back in a state of air harmony that they were uh, before colonial time. I conclude here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Corina. And uh, the floor for discussion is open.